Uh, folks, my, my name is John Mugno, and I'm the host of today's Rybrook Focus Program. Today's guest is uh, Greg Hamilton, who is the Rye Town Municipal Historian. Welcome, Greg. Thank you, John. Uh, this is Greg's first time on uh, Rybrook Focus, and his, his, his topic today is the history of Rye Town beginning in the colonial period. Uh, we hope to be able to cover it today. If not, we'll, have, we'll invite Greg back for another meeting. As our audience knows, Rybrook in June celebrated its 40th birthday and is a part of the town of Rye. So any early history that places the area in a larger historical context needs to focus on the larger entity, which currently we would call the town of Rye. We're fortunate to have Greg as our guest today to do just that. Greg, can you tell me about your interest in local history and when you became the uh, Rye Town Municipal Historian? Happy to do that. Um, so I, I'm a retiree, moved up to Fort Chester in 2008 and um, uh, retired um, somewhere around 2015 and, uh, and started volunteering. Um, in uh, 2018, it was the 150th anniversary of Fort Chester's incorporation. And so there were celebrations around the village. And I, um, uh, just in the interest of participating, developed a 90 minute walking tour of Fort Chester that winds its way down Westchester Avenue to Main Street. Uh, the, uh, the town of Fort Chester, the village of Fort Chester is in many ways, uh, the story of the history of, of America. And um, on the strength of that walking tour, the village asked me if I would uh, fill the um, volunteer role of town uh, of municipal historian. I agreed. And um, shortly thereafter, the uh, town of Rye uh, also asked me to uh, become their municipal historian. Every municipality in New York State, by uh, Dint of New York State Law 1919 has a, is, is supposed to have a municipal historian. Um, but not everyone does. There are about 2,600 municipalities in the state. And I, um, um, when I took on the town of Rye Roll, I was afraid that I might be overburdened. So I resigned as the historian of the village of Porchester and I'm now uh, remain uh, the municipal historian of the town of Rye, which encompasses Fort Chester. Um, so uh, that's how it got started. And uh, there is a very active historical society in the village. Uh, it meets, it used to meet in person in the Bush Lion Homestead. That's basically its clubhouse, but now it largely meets via Zoom on Thursday evenings once a month. And um, I continue to be a member of that society and contribute what I can. And uh, I, I suspect it's through them, John, that you found me. Right. Well, Greg, I know you have a, a number of slides you want to share with us. And if we could get started now, and Greg will be starting back in the colonial period, really. True, although I um, I try to step back to the, uh, to the very beginning. Uh, I hope this is... Let's see if I can page down. There we go. Um, uh, there were, of course, Native Americans here before us, and um, uh, the Lenape Indians, uh, I think, was the most common tribe in the area. They stretch uh, from Delaware up to eastern Pennsylvania, um, much of New Jersey and lower New York. There were also Mohegans that migrated back and forth from Connecticut, and um, of course, it was the Dutch that first colonized the island of Manhattan, and um, eventually uh, the English were able to evict the Dutch. The Dutch sort of retreated north, and um, uh, the uh, white uh, European immigrants, of course, had um, had guns and other armors, armor, and um, were able to displace uh, the Indians over time, uh, inevitably and inexorably. Um, uh, the Indians moved, moved away, moved to safer territory. It was not a, not a pretty um, uh, hundred years since the um, uh, 
director of the Dutch uh, West India Company, uh, made it his personal mission to try to evict Native Americans from the Sound Shore. Um, so um, the Indians moved on. The Dutch retreated from the uh, English uh, fortress of Manhattan and 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 settled here and um, soon encountered, uh, uh, I think, English in Connecticut who were um, uh, retreating from the you know the colonies farther north. Um, so uh, indeed, uh, there then followed uh, the road to independence and the. Um, independence actually um, uh, inflamed uh, passions all through this area. Um, uh, indeed, uh, the contrast between patriots and loyalists often um, split families um, into uh, uh, mixed, <laughs> mixed sympathies. Um, in, uh, uh, in 1750, uh, around a quarter of Westchester's population was black slaves and slavery continued to thrive here um, until New York State passed a law calling for its elimination in 1799. Um, but the, uh, uh, we sometimes refer to the Revolutionary War as America's first civil war or Westchester's first civil war um, be because it, it divided the population so um, uh, Passionately, um, there was a, a sheriff, former sheriff of Westchester, um, who indeed was a, a loyalist, loyal to the crown, and raised a troop of 500 fighters and conducted a war of terror. Um, one of the most hated loyalists of the period. Um, there was fighting here during the Revolutionary War, of course. Um, George Washington sort of forged his reputation as a uh, as a general at the Battle of White Plains in 1776, when he managed to retreat from a superior force of, of uh, uh, British and Hessian troops, um, uh, crossed the Hudson and eventually uh, retreated all the way to Pennsylvania. Mm. Greg, yep. let me interrupt one second before Please. we leave this slide. And uh, let me just ask, do we know, uh, I think many people will be surprised that 25% of Westchester's population was black slaves. What, do, we, do we have any insight into what, what they were doing, what work they were enslaved to do? They were, I, I suspect they're mostly doing farming, farming, but also housework, you know, cooks, cooks and cleaning. Um, in fact, um, I've been told that much of the uh, um, agricultural knowledge um, uh, in the uh, pre-revolutionary period and indeed in the uh, 19th century was um, uh, was in the um, uh, was essentially in the in the not the knowledge resided within the slaves they were they were the ones that knew when to plant how to uh, um, uh, nurture and when to harvest uh, as opposed to the uh, the settlers, the Indians have been planting corn for um, um, many years, but they uh, did not, Indians did not take to servitude and rather than um, help uh, the early settlers with uh, agriculture, they generally headed west. So I think it was the slaves that largely uh, tilled the fields. And Westchester was very fertile. Port Chester indeed um, had, uh, Quite a few very large farms, uh, successful dairy farming, but also you know other livestock, horses, um, and, um, and wheat and crops. And I think that um, uh, Porchester's uh, early success was attributed in part to that successful agriculture. Again, fertile land and um, uh, temperate climate. Um, Port Chester really got started as a, a, cross, a transportation hub, if you will. There was um, uh, a, a, the Byron River flowing into what, you know, what was in a sense a port, although there wasn't so much merchandise coming in out of Port Chester as there were people 
uh, there was a ferry service that ran three times to uh, per week to New York. And um, um, the Boston Post Road, which was the, the route for mail uh, from New York to Boston, ran through here. And, um, uh, and so um, uh, Portchester flourished as a rest stop on the Boston Post Road. You know, we have about a day's carriage right out of New York. You need, now need a place to put your uh, stables, to put your horses up. You need uh, taverns, a place to sleep, and a place to eat, and a place to outfit yourself if, if something broke on your carriage or in your, um, uh, uh, in your saddle. And so uh, this uh, transportation hub combination of uh, mail route, ferry service um, was what, you know, was, um, what our early commerce was, was based on that. Stores, taverns, um, um, and rooming houses to service uh, uh, people coming through. Um, there were um, railroads that competed uh, to, uh, uh, to move merchandise and people. And indeed by 1862, there were numerous railroads that were coming north from New York um, I believe three of them terminated in uh, in Porchester, and um, uh, the New Haven line itself was completed in 1848, driven chiefly by the New York City's thirst for fresh milk. And so, even before there was refrigeration, um, uh, urns of fresh milk were being placed into hammocks filled with ice on rail cars and run down to New York City on a, uh, on a daily basis. And so a um, combination of, um, of uh, rail lines, um, carriage routes, and, uh, and ferry traffic uh, turned Porchester into a, a thriving little community rest stop, um, which uh, you know, entrepreneurs found a way to, to profit, obviously, from uh, the track that was flowing through. Um, uh, fast forward to uh, the middle of the 19th century and the Civil War again divided, divided Westchester residents um, between uh, folks sympathetic to uh, uh, the Southern secession and the, the institution of slavery and other people that, you know, that felt that um, uh, the Union should be preserved. Um, as you may know, draft riots broke out in, in New York City when the federal government instituted a draft, and those similarly uh, took place here in Westchester um, when, the, uh, when the government needed more troops in order to uh, conduct the war um, against, the, uh, against the South. Um, there were um, uh, ugly scenes of residents um, attacking Blacks uh, as a, a symbol of the, uh, of the Southern secession and indeed of the South itself. Um, there was a pretty healthy community of Blacks in, uh, called the Hills in Harrison, um, working as laborers, domestic workers and farmers. And um, at least 36 Black men from that community uh, signed up with, a, uh, a New with the New England regiments that were that allowed black enlistments um, and, uh, and apparently served admirably um, uh, fighting on behalf of the North um, in, in the Civil War. Um, some indeed are buried in the African American Cemetery in Rye, which exists to this day. It's uh, definitely a location here on the South Shore that's worth visiting. Um, here's a depiction of um, early Port Chester from 1871 essentially showing farmland. That road on the right is uh, what eventually turned into King Street. And this is looking down from the, um, the heights of roughly Lion Park out over uh, the village as it, as it grew, uh, as it spread from the um, uh, Byram River and the, uh, and the mail route uh, spread up um, King Street. Uh, and Westchester Avenue. Westchester Avenue being the main east-west route um, that connected uh, Portchester 
eventually to the Hudson River and the, um, of course, the Tappan Sea Bridge, which was not built until the 20th century. But um, here you can see a relatively pastoral scene, uh, early Porchester, and you have to think farms that, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the estates of these farmers, you know, uh, were turned into uh, townhouse developments. Uh, Lion Farm itself is a townhouse development that grew out of uh, an estate uh, here in uh, uh, up, uptown Porchester and um, uh, uh, Lion Park was originally the, uh, and, uh, you know, the homestead and farm of the Bush Lion family. Um, here's uh, a view of, of downtown Porchester in 1890, and you can see it was, you know, not well paved, um, but there were plenty of plenty of stores that had sprouted up again to serve the traffic flowing through. And um, indeed, I believe that's the remnants of a trolley line down the center of Main Street. Um, um, riding uh, in carriages was not not a comfortable business. It was probably much easier to ride on horseback um, because you know roads were not paved, and indeed in um, and a downpour could get you know could get washed out or uh, rutted or pitted, and um, uh, so uh, there was thriving competition between the, the carriage routes, the, the ferries, and the uh, and the rail lines. Um, uh, here we see a um, on the left an image of the Glenville. This was the ferry that, that uh, traveled to New York City three times a week. This, this is a postcard, picture postcard that's been colored by hand, dated 1906. And on the right, you see an aerial image of uh, the Byram River. Um, and you can see that uh, Porchester Harbor was really quite um, sheltered. Uh, it was, uh, you had to be knowledgeable to navigate your way in it. You can see how it, it loops around here. Um, this is, uh, what was Fox Island. Um, Costco would have been in this section here and there's the cut and the Byron River continues on up. Um, uh, this is now a water treatment plant or just this water treatment plant. Um, here's an overhead view of uh, what essentially became an important part of Rybrook. Um, and this is uh, when in the early 20th century, when uh, wealthy Manhattanites uh, started to um, uh, buy homes and build build mansions in the Westchester suburbs, not unlike um, happened centuries ago in Rome, uh, when the uh, the wealthy um, Romans um, found that it was more comfortable to get out of the city during the summer and retreat to a country estate, and um, this stretch of land here uh, was. The Crawford Estate, founded by Everett Crawford, he was a, um, a stockbroker, um, had um, had three daughters and um, a fondness for horses. He um, held a polo match on this estate in 1912. It was actually a fundraiser uh, to launch United Hospital. He was one of the early founders of United Hospital. Um, had three daughters and. Um, uh, Crawford Estate, of course, survives to this day, and the, um, the building has been very nicely renovated recently. It costs about $3 million. It's owned by the town of Rye. Now, right across this wall is what was the Edgar Price Estate. Uh, no remnant of that estate survives. Edgar Price um, was an early inventor of, uh, of methane. He worked at Union Carbide, and uh, that he became quite wealthy on the strength of, um, of that company. Um, although the um, uh, Union Carbide was, was bankrupted, bankrupted by the uh, Bhopal disaster in India where a train of um, uh, train cars filled with uh, lethal gas tipped over and killed uh, thousands of residents. Um, the Price Estate was ultimately purchased and converted into uh, Westchester Hilton, and indeed 
its carriage entrance, which you can see winding here through the um, uh, through the forest on the estate. Um, it remains and was the was converted to the entry to the uh, Westchester Hilton, which of course has been closed now for a few years. But um, uh, if you if you're driving along Westchester Avenue here, you can still see remnants of that building. Um, Price Estate is actually owned by uh, Rye Town, uh, as opposed to the Crawford Estate, which is owned by the. Uh, I'm sorry, got that. Price Estate is owned by the village of Ryebrook. The Crawford Estate is owned by the town of Rye. But you see, there were others here: the Allen Estate and the Clausen Estate. Um, um, and down here, um, property that uh, was actually a, um, a country club and was later converted into the grounds for the uh, Porchester High School. Um, so this is, I don't know how they got these very crisp aerial views from the uh, early 1900s, but um, they survived to this day. Um, on the left here, you see the uh, gatehouse to the Palmer Estate. Um, uh, some of these pillars survive at Quintar Drive in King Street. And the, the gatehouse itself um, is currently occupied by a, uh, a town of Wright Councilman named Tom Nardi. Um, and, and it survives. So this is King Street running left to right and Quintard Drive going in through what were the gates to the Palmer Estate. There's another um, mansion that was on Gamecock Island in the, uh, in the harbor on the Byram Shore. Um, there was um, you know, quite a few large homes that were built. Here's one that, uh, that remains. This was uh, built by a, um, an entrepreneur named Ward. Um, uh, he built a mill up in Pemberwick um, and um, uh, was a quite successful industrialist. Um, his wife had a deathly fear of kitchen fires. And so he built her a home entirely out of concrete which of course was not combustible. Um, and if you look carefully, you can see that it, it has been expanded on it. Here's an old picture of it. And here you can see a wing that was expanded over time. It did serve for about um, 10 or 12 years as a museum of, uh, cartoon, of, cart, of the art of cartoons. Um, it was uh, bought and converted to the purpose by the uh, the Beetle Bailey cartoonist. Um, this is on um, at, uh, Magnolia Drive at the north end of Porchester, and uh, you can drive by it and see it to this day. It's also memorialized in a mural inside the um, Porchester's post office. Um, now Ward, um, the industrialist, um, subsequently joined forces with um, um, uh, entrepreneurs named um, Birdsall and Russell, and the three of them built a very large uh, factory in Porchester, which you know, uh, survived into the 1960s. Um, here's um, the Palmer Estate when it existed, with a, a pool in front, and here you see it as it was uh, started to be demolished in the mid 20th century, um, the pool drained. Um, so as we move into the 20th century, um, the Sound Shore um, really flourished. Um, uh, the entrepreneur who built Ward's castle had a son named William E. Ward, who came to be known as Boss Ward and um, um, uh, was a dominant political figure in the um, um, in the early 20th century. He was born in Greenwich, raised in Porchester, was an heir to the Russell, Birdsall, and Ward factory, and um, a Quaker, as it turns out. Um, but he became chair of the Republican Party uh, from the, from its inception on the Sound Shore, and controlled that for 37 years until he passed in 1933. He oversaw the construction of parkways, including the uh, 
uh, the Hutchinson and the Merritt, but also the Bronx River Parkway, the County Park System, Flail and the Museum Park, and the Westchester County Center. All of this, again, text in red. Um, I'm footnoting and attributing, I, I borrowed it from um, uh, Robert Marchand's History of Westchester, an iconic suburb. Um, and um, that book came out in 2019. Um, so um, right, right about the time that uh, William Ward um, uh, was you know, felled by pneumonia and passed away, um, the uh, South Shore emerged from uh, prohibition, period of prohibition. And there were um, speakeasies all over Fort Chester. There were um, uh, the proverbial floating games of craps and cards um, in uh, Maranek. And by floating, I meant that their, their location varied from, um, uh, from week to week in order to avoid, avoid uh, the authorities and the law. Um, it was also prostitution and, and corruption uh, into the 1930s. Um, so Fort Chester in some ways was a, a, a den of vice in this period. Meanwhile, Ford, uh, who had a plant over in Tarrytown and was churning out Model Ts and other automobiles that the middle class could afford, um, uh, contributed mightily to uh, suburban sprawl. Where, whereas wealthy New Yorkers were coming up here and, and building estates and mansions, um, the middle class also saw an opportunity uh, to retreat to the country, uh, particularly during the summer. Um, and the car afforded them the mobility to, uh, uh, to uh, get to their own smaller uh, country homes. Um, you get a sense of how the, um, the Sound Shore flourished and that it was able to support uh, the construction of two theaters. Um, Thomas H. Lamb, who's a renowned theater architect and to this day has over 150 theaters that he designed uh, that uh, survived, stretched from America to India. Uh, he designed um, the Embassy Theater, which is unfortunately uh, suffering decrepitude at the moment, it is on Main Street. You can see remnants of it. Um, uh, there's a hole in the roof though, so that there's, there's little chance of that theater ever being restored. And the Capitol Theater, both designed by uh, Thomas Lamb. The Capitol Theater and the embassy opened in 1925 and 1926. And so the community had to be really pretty economically healthy to support two different theaters opening within uh, a year of each other. Uh, Vaudeville, of course, was the early um, uh, content but uh, you know, over time, this was replaced by um, uh, uh, by uh, active theater groups, but also uh, traveling road shows and uh, musical performances. The Capitol Theater um, was bought by um, Peter Shapiro, owner of the Brooklyn Bowl, and completely overhauled and reopened in 2012. Uh, the first act booked into the newly reopened Capitol Theater was none other than Bob Dylan. Um, okay, so uh, the, the jobs in the, uh, in the Sound Shore were, were furnished by industrialists in many cases. There had been farming, of course, um, but uh, soon enough with a you know, flow of immigrants, uh, fleeing the Irish potato famine, for example, in the 1850s um, and 1840s, but also um, Italian immigrants um, seeking a better life, uh, could find jobs at um, uh, the Avondroth Eagle Foundry and Stove Works, which is right down on the Byron River. And that's depicted in the postcard on the left side of the slide, uh, spewing smoke. Um, uh, the foundry was um, uh, very successful, and you'll still find there's actually a stove in the Bush Lion homestead that was uh, that was uh, cast 
at this foundry right here in town. You'll also see manhole covers with the name Avonroth Foundry on them or Eagle Foundry. Um, the Ernest Simon shirt manufacturing uh, uh, was the first factory in North America to uh, produce ready-made sheets and pillowcases. And it thrived um, into the 20th century. It was a place for seamstresses to work. Um, the factory um, closed in 1939, just ahead of World War II, but reopened in World War II in order to build parachutes and military uniforms. The uh, building survives. It is a fabulous restoration and is now filled with small businesses, including law offices, design shops, Pilates studios, uh, accounting offices. And there are a couple of developers that have their, that are headquartered in the Ernest Simons shirt manufacturing building. Fruit of the Loom had its headquarters there during its heyday um, before it moved uh, to the Midwest. The Lifesaver Factory um, uh, was here on Main Street in Port Chester, closed in 1984 and was subsequently converted to a uh, uh, to condominium uh, homes. But it was um, also a renowned local employer, ran three shifts round the clock and um, uh, the flavor of the day could generally be smelt throughout the village with um, butterscotch being a local favorite. Um, so um, Rye, New York and Greenwich, Connecticut involved, evolved into very wealthy enclaves um, in Port Chester sitting between those two communities um, essentially provided housing for uh, middle-class residents. Uh, uh, the middle-class workers who staffed the factories and were employed as service workers in the um, neighboring wealthier uh, Greenwich and Rye communities. Here we see an overhead view of what was uh, the, uh, the country club in Port Chester. Uh, I believe its origins were the Tamarack Estate. And you can see where uh, the high school building was ultimately erected. So all of this space here was a golf course. And um, uh, the high school was situated here. There were athletic fields, Park Avenue School here. And um, so half of the, this country club was converted into the high school and its athletic fields. And the half to the north was carved up into um, parcels of middle class housing. Um, you don't see Haynes Boulevard yet, but it would have flowed this way. Um, and here you see Glen Avenue and Lafayette. You can't quite see King Street, which would have flowed up here. This is an overhead view from 1926, when the uh, country club was being converted into the high school and, um, and carved up into uh, middle-class parcels. Here's a view um, from a map that's in the homestead showing um, that uh, Tamarack property, here's the Park Avenue School, and how the surrounding property was carved up into much smaller parcels, okay, for, for middle-class housing. Um, here again, uh, King Street's not quite visible, it'd be down below here, uh, running from the uh, lower left to the, uh, to the upper right, but um, uh, you can see uh, these parcels were really quite small so that the middle class could afford the homes. Here is a, another map from the homestead. I'm sorry, this isn't a very good focus, but it's for a similar uh, section of the uh, village and indeed um, just below Rybrook. And uh, the title says Colonial Ridge at 50% of value, sale to close estate, 50% discount on value until November 1st, 1917. Buy early and get your choice. And you can see um, small properties along Glen Street here, but larger properties on Lafayette and Terrace and Puritan Drive and down here on Brown, uh, Browndale, Indian Road. These um, parcels survive to this day. Um, uh, and so this was a map that was used to show 
you know, which parcels have been sold already and which parcels were still available for sale here in uh, 1917. So here's an interior view of the Russell Bursall and Ward nut and bolt factory. You can see um, uh, it was an immense space um, nestled up against the train tracks, which of course would uh, deliver supplies and, and carry away finished uh, nuts and bolts and, and other things that had been machined in the factory. This was sometime in the 50s. The factory opened in 1900 and it, it was quite a large facility. Again, ran three shifts around the clock and practically everybody knew someone who worked at, uh, at the RVW plant. In 1963, it suffered a, a catastrophic fire. Um, the, the buildings were built out of lumber um, and they had become soaked with the lubricants from, uh, from the interior machines. And there was no technology at the time to smother oil fires. So this um, smoldered for three days and the factory was not well, was not repairable. It reopened in facilities, I think one in the Midwest and one on the West Coast. Um, but it was a um, uh, an important contributor indeed to the war effort. This is a, a, an ad on the right here, an ad from a, a magazine, our, our B and W making strong the things that make America strong, with a, a picture of a duck boat saved by a thousandth part. I have, I have other ads from this era. They were it was really charming um, during the war effort, how they were um, uh, touting their contribution to um, uh, the, uh, the battle on behalf of the free world. Um, but, you know, uh, RBW was actually among the last of the um, large factories to close. Um, higher labor costs, and electricity and transportation in the Northeast put um, the industry in this section of the country at a disadvantage compared to uh, the Midwest. And so one by one, giants of the industry were laid low. Abendroth factory closed in 1920. Ernest Simons in 1939, although it did reopen briefly during World War II. Uh, Nut and Bolt factory in 1963 and the Lifesaver factory closed in 1984. Um, of course, the loss of these factories meant the loss of jobs, huge numbers of jobs. Um, and um, uh, so the um, uh, uh, people had to, uh, had to start other businesses. Um, um, and I'll, I'll return to that topic in, a, in another slide or so. Now, New York state law has um, very specific law around municipalities governing and defining hamlets, towns, villages, and cities, which are actually all legally different, um, having different government bodies and, and different uh, rights of taxation. Uh, and just as an example, um, uh, villages are able to appoint their judges whereas towns um, by New York state law must elect them. So there's some quite arcane details and differences between um, uh, these various municipalities in the state of New York. And um, this uh, yields some real idiosyncrasies which you'll see on the, uh, on the fourth bullet here. Orchester, which had um, been initially named Sawpit after technology for making lumber out of logs, uh, had incorporated way back in 1868 as a village under New York state law and had uh, survived uh, on that basis, survived the, um, uh, the arrival of, of heavy industry and the departure of that industry and wave after wave of immigrants. Porchester tended to be a place they landed. Immigrants tended to go where the uh, immigrants have gone before them. Um, and um, soon this town of Rye, which was uh, really quite wealthy and occupied by um, uh, people that were uh, working in New York City and commuting, um, realized that um, 
the, the difference in their income between them and neighboring Porchester um, made it um, advantageous for them to incorporate uh, separately and thus um, uh, isolate their tax base and financial liabilities from those of the surrounding community. Um, so the city of Rye applied uh, to be incorporated as a city and were approved in 1942. They are the, um, uh, the last city to form in the state of New York and thus the youngest city. Um, and by uh, incorporating as a city, they carved themselves uh, apart from Porchester, um, uh, unincorporated area to the north of Porchester, which eventually became Rye Brook, and a section of Maranek known as Rye Neck. Um, and those three com surrounding communities, Porchester, Rye Brook, and Rye Neck, um, eventually became incorporated as the town of Rye, as which is quite distinct from the city of Rye. So the city of Rye sits in the center of these three communities, um, which don't actually, uh, Rye Neck doesn't actually even touch either Rye Brook or Porchester, um, but um, uh, is uh, isolated from the rest of the town of Rye by the city of Rye itself. Um, Porchester, of course, had its its own its own schools. It had built its um, its high school, um, public high school. Um, meanwhile, Rybrook had uh, built Blindbrook High School in 1973. So they were almost competing public high schools in neighboring communities, and um, uh, the residents of Rye, unincorporated property that uh, was north of Porchester decided. They too wanted to control of their taxes and local government. And by dint of a 58% favorable vote in a referendum, uh, they incorporated it as a village in 1982, uh, the first new village in New York State since 1928. And that's um, how Rybrook came to be. Um, so uh, as we move through the 20th century, the uh, flavor of immigration changes. In the second half, we started to have a, uh, a fresh influx of Spanish-speaking refugees and immigrants from Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central America. Um, Porchester being a, 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 a very common destination for these Spanish-speaking immigrants. And um, as the uh, 20th century closed, um, Porchester was now a a, a village of two and a half square miles with about 10,000 dwelling units, 30,000 residents, and um, actually a majority of Spanish speakers. By the time the 2020 census rolled around, uh, Port Chester was 62% uh, Spanish speaking, and indeed 80% of our of the first grade classes in the elementary schools in Port Chester live in Spanish speaking households. Again, quoting statistics from Robert Marchant, um, in, in 2000, about 16% of the county's population was Hispanic compared to 10% um, 10 years earlier. And by um, uh, uh, 2020, Porchester itself was actually a uh, clear majority Hispanic, 62%. Um, meanwhile, the number of Hispanics in the county rose steadily from you know, 45,000 and change in 1980 to 144,000, 100,000 more by 2000. And so these demographic changes eventually, of course, cause a shift in political power. It takes the immigrants some years to gain citizenship and, and the ability to vote. Um, but you know, the ch this change is, is inexorable. Um, and um, in 2021, indeed, Port Chester elected its first Hispanic mayor, Louis Marino. Um, there are currently um, three members of the Board of Trustees in Port Chester who uh, can speak and converse in Spanish. 
Um, so not a majority of the seven, but the mayor uh, uh, being a, um, a, Spanish, a natural born Spanish speaker, born and raised in Peru. Um, uh, so there was actually a majority of the board of trustees, four out of the seven uh, who can um, converse and communicate in Spanish. Um, actually, I think that's, I'm wrong. It's not four, it's actually three at the moment. So um, three of the seven can converse in Spanish, not yet a majority of the, of the local uh, government. But the largest employers in Porchester currently are two bakeries, Nairies, which is a private label bakery that produces Bread for Arnold's and uh, Thomas's, English muffins, for example, and Cassone's, which um, uh, does produce uh, breads labeled branded Cassone's. Both of those plants operate 24 seven. Uh, many of the workers are uh, recent immigrants. Um, and um, uh, again, those are the two single largest employers. Next on the list would be the landscaping industry where there are literally hundreds of small businesses that rely on working class residents and hourly day workers to tend property, both in the village and, and up and down the Sound Shore, Rye, New York, and Greenwich, and, uh, White Plains to the West. Um, and you can see these landscapers uh, towing their, their gear around morning, noon, and night uh, here on the Sound Shore. Um, so Porchester has now um, uh, evolved um, to be essentially the service workers community, um, serving the more affluent neighboring uh, uh, cities. And um, here in Porchester, we're, we're sometimes referred to as the restaurant capital of Westchester with more than a hundred eateries of every ethnicity and flavor, probably 15 to 20 that claim to be Peruvian restaurants, but um, certainly every version of uh, South and Central America, including Mexican, Guatemalan, El Salvadoran, uh, Brazilian, um, uh, as I said, 15 to 20 Peruvian, Colombian, it's all, it's all here in Fort Chester with um, the Capitol Theater being a, a big draw for um, nightlife and entertainment. Um, but our, um, our, in terms of income, Porchester ranks almost at the bottom of the municipalities in the, in the county. We see Scarsdale at the top, Armont next, and way down at the bottom, um, uh, Porchester ranking 51st out of 52 municipalities. And in this case, it's a uh, the percentage of households with incomes above 100,000. I couldn't find a good chart um, based on median income, but you see that um, Rybrook is ranking right here in the middle, rise up, up just about the top quartile, and Fort Chester is ranked uh, second from the bottom um, in the municipalities in, um, in Fort Chester. If, um, if you're interested in local history and want to get more involved, I can recommend to your attention the Porchester Historical Society and the uh, Rye Historical Society, both of which have very well-developed um, websites um, and, um, uh, and regular meetings that you can sign up to attend. So I'm here in the 21st century. You know, obviously the evolution continues here in Fort Chester, our land is cheaper probably than just about anywhere else in the, in the county. And so we've had uh, developers descend upon us. There are about 3,500 uh, dwelling units on the drawing board in Fort Chester at the moment, promising to grow the village by a third over the next five years. Um, uh, the uh, development is characterized as transit oriented is designed to be as near as possible. I'm trying to build apartments as near as possible to the train stops so that uh, white collar commuters can um, uh, walk to the train station and commute to jobs 
either in Stanford going north or New York City going south. And uh, this gentrification is likely to raise to raise rents, um, perhaps force out much of our middle class. Uh, Rybrook, by contrast, is much more homogenous and wealthier, ranking 24th, just about midway in the county versus Portchester at 51st. And John, that wraps up my slides. So we're well under the hour here. Did you have any questions you wanted to follow up? Okay, Greg, let me, let me just ask you a few that came to me while you were speaking. The first is you, you cite the uh, four industrial firms as having been the most important. Yes. Um, were they the four largest uh, industrial firms in the oh, area? Clear, clearly, yes, yes. Clear. There, there, was, there was a greeting card company, printer. Um, there was a, um, a daily item, you know, a newspaper. Probably didn't employ that many. But yeah, those four were head and shoulders above the others hmm. uh, in terms of employment. Um, and um, every one of them operated 24-7. So, I mean, the Lifesaver plant had on, on the order of 600 employees. RBW at its peak may have been, may have been a thousand. I don't, I don't have a number offhand for their employment, but yeah, these were, these were the big boys. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, the story that you've told is not so different than you see in other parts of even New York State or the Northeast, where, as you said, uh, things like cost of labor, taxes, cost of land, uh, gave incentives for various industries to uh, relocate to yep. other parts of the country, be it the Midwest or the Southern states. Yep. The, the, what's interesting, I think, about the story you've told for Port Chester is it is, in fact, reinventing itself again as Correct. something i mean it has not it has not just stopped evolving it seems to be moving toward uh, a being uh, or having an economic base that is something different than an industrial base whereas the surrounding areas tend to be more just communities without any industrial base at all not even much of it a commercial but base. needing needing service workers and needing many, of those, many of those service workers live here in port chester whether it's right. nannies housekeepers um of course with those hundred plus restaurants in town we have you know we have a, a, a substantial need for waiters and waitresses and sous chefs and um and delivery personnel as we as became evident during the pandemic but so yeah, I think of Port Chester as the uh, service community, you know, um, uh, housing the middle class that serves the affluent suburbs that surround us. But as I said um, near the beginning, you know, the history of Port Chester is really quite prototypical of the history of um, of America. And the early New England towns were not so different, with uh, you know transportation giving away to industry. Uh, and farming and, and that eventually yielding to um, uh, service workers and other lighter industry. Um, and it, it wasn't just, you know, the cost of operating that, uh, that caused these factories to close. You know, if you're, if you're selling product to the nation, you know, it's much more convenient to be located in the Midwest um, where you can ship to both the East Coast and the West Coast and, you know, North to Michigan and South to the uh, uh, to the southern states than to be situated in the northeast where the uh, supply lines for both delivery of raw materials and shipment of finished goods you know, were in inherently longer. So. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Greg. This has been interesting. I, I think there were aspects of the area's history that um, people would not have been familiar with. And I think this served as a really good introduction to how we came to be where we are, in a sense. So thank you very much. We, we appreciate your being on the program.
and look forward to having you as a guest again. Thank you, John, for inviting me. I look forward to that as well. Um, but I look forward to seeing the playback. I felt um, uh, uh, sketchy at first, but you know, it did settle down. Um, and it's um, uh, it, 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 this is, of course, the proverbial unfinished essay. There's always more research that could be done. There are more stories that could be chased down. You know, I didn't didn't I didn't get to talk about any of the celebrities that you know that uh, uh, that grew up in, in in the village. Not the least of which was Ed Sullivan, uh, but Amelia Earhart also lived uh, in the Sound Shore and and uh, made a name for herself before disappearing somewhere in the Pacific. Um, and there are more. Um, so, thank you again, John, and um, I look forward to. Um, uh, perhaps making another appearance if we can come up with a uh, with, a, with a, a topic that deserves uh, that deserves this treatment. Okay. Well, thank you again, Greg. Have a good weekend and stay cool.